So we're beginning the book of James. Simple title this morning is Introduction to the Book of James. Nothing funny or humorous in that, but uh, it'll be the first in a series. And I want to talk about uh, who James was, who he's writing to, what's the theme of his letter. At first it may be like, well, you know, it's just kind of some uh, facts about James, but actually there's application in these facts. There's application as we learn about James. I'm just going to start reading uh, verse 1 and the first two words of verse 2. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren. Greeting my brethren. I thought about entitling this, Was James the Brother of Jesus? But my, my point of the sermon gets way beyond that. But it's a big question that scholars have debated over is who was James because there's, there's at least two, maybe three Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. There's James who was the brother of John. James and John were fishermen. They were the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Jesus called them. And so there's one James that I suppose some people may think, well, maybe that's the James that was writing. However, it's very, very uh, doubtful because in Acts 12.1, we're told, an amount, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That was very early in the book of Acts. And he's probably your first of the apostles that was martyred. He was the first of the apostles that was martyred. He was the first one. And so that couldn't probably be him because James has evidence inside of it that shows that it was later written. It wasn't written that early in the church. It was written later. More, I, I would believe, closer to the destruction of Jerusalem, although there's some scholars who, who believe that James may even be the earliest book of the New Testament. But I don't think so because of certain things he refers to, the destruction being at hand, the judges at the door. Then there's James, the son of Alphaeus, another disciple that is mentioned that we know virtually nothing about. We don't know much about James, the son of Alphaeus, just has his name mentioned. And one commentator I read believes that James, the son of Alphaeus and James, the pastor of Jerusalem is the same person. There's some that have that theory that what, what complicates it is that numerous times James is referred to as the brother of our Lord. Judas, the opening, Jude, who's also called Judas, one of the Judases, uh, Jude is actually, its opening words is the revel, uh, let me turn there for a second. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father. So Jude reveals himself as the brother of James. And in multiple passages, when the brothers of Jesus are mentioned, Judas is mentioned, for example, in Matthew 13, 55. Is, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his Mary, mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So there are two people referred to as brethren of Jesus, four in this passage, both one of which is James and one of which is Judas. Also in Matthew 27, 56, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. So that uh, was another mention of James and Joseph. Then in Mark 6, 3, the people of Nazareth, rejecting Jesus, said, Is not this the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So several times we're giving a list that Jesus had brothers and sisters sisters plural of course this doesn't have any big conflict with protestants but it has a big conflict with those who believe in the perpetual virginity of mary so what the catholic church has said is that these are actually probably cousins or something else and and there there is a possibility that the word brother does refer to cousins it's a possibility that it could be but i i don't think that even then you have a good stance for the perpetual virginity of Mary because we're told that Mary knew not Joseph until the child was born. And second of all, for those also wondering if 
Mary was a perpetual virgin, this doesn't make her immaculate, this makes her a thief. Because if you look in 1 Corinthians 7, we're told that the body of the wife belongs to the husband, and the body of the husband belongs to the wife, and that if it's withheld, it's actually defrauding. It's thievery. So if Mary never fulfilled her duty as the wife of Joseph, she was in violation of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I don't want to go on too big of a rabbit trail there, but it does have implications that uh, our bodies are not our own. And we're to believe that Mary was a godly woman, a godly wife, and therefore she would have done her duty to her husband at the very least. But was he the brother of Jesus? Well, I, I've, got, I've got other passages that mentions. In fact, in John 7, just, just I, I won't go into it, but it's interesting that his brethren are referred to early on as not even believing in Jesus. It wasn't until later on. But I want to go to a, a much more conclusive passage that has application and relevance to us and I think actually helps us to understand the book of James very well. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, 46, but keep your finger, keep your ribbon in this passage. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. This is an important passage. I think it's a key to understanding the book of James, and it's going to lead to some real application for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, 46, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So the answer to the question, Was James the brother of Jesus? Is an emphatic yes. Biologically, I'm not 100% sure. I think very likely he's referred to multiple times, even in the book of Acts, he's referred to twice as the brother of our Lord. Eusebius refers to him as the brother of Jesus. Josephus refers to him as the brother of Jesus. But how does he introduce himself? James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren. Now this is interesting. Because he loves this phrase, my brethren. He says, in in first of all, in two, he refers to his audience as my brethren. Then on down, later in the chapter, he says in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren. Chapter 2, verse 1, my brethren. Chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren. James loves this phrase, my brethren. And I think he's doing it intentionally. He doesn't say, I, James, the apostle, which he is referred to as an apostle, though not one of the twelve. He was the bishop of Jerusalem. He doesn't say, I, James, the bishop of Jerusalem, chosen to be the bishop of Jerusalem right unto you. He doesn't say, I, the prestigious brother of Jesus, with biological blood of Mary running through my veins. How does he introduce himself? James, a servant of God servant is a little tame. James, the slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies himself as the servant of Jesus and as your brethren. Perhaps remembering the day that he was there with his mother, walked up and said, we are here to see our brother Jesus. And Jesus said publicly, Who's my mother? Who's my brothers? Who's my sisters? I tell you, it is the one that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And what is the theme of the book of James? Here's the theme of the book of James. We're going to go over it again and again and again. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, we believe very strongly that faith alone saves without the works of the law. That is taught in Romans and Galatians. It's taught everywhere. Faith without the works of the law. We cannot add to what Jesus did to us on the cross. 
Jesus was a substitutionary atonement, which means Jesus took your sins upon Himself and He gave His righteousness to you and it is the free gift of God to those who call upon His name. You can't add to it. And yet James tells us emphatically that faith without works is dead. If you have a living faith and the living Savior is going to produce living works in your life. Faith, if it doesn't have works, is a dead faith. If a body doesn't have a spirit, it's a dead body. And faith without works is dead. And so what James wants really us to know is, listen, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you living it? Is it manifesting itself in your life? Because if you think, because you walk down an aisle and you said a prayer, or you put a bumper sticker on the back of your car, that you decided to make Him Lord of your life, and it doesn't have any fruit in your life, brother and sister, you need to search and find out, are you a false convert? Because I want to tell you, there are multitudes of people that call themselves Christians, that walked down an aisle and repeated a prayer, and they walked off, and they live just like the Canaanite next door, and they have zero evidence or fruit in their life that they are saved. And so James pushes the fact, is there fruit in your life? John the Baptist, in the beginning of his ministry, the Pharisees come to him and he says, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you brood of snakes? You family of vipers. Who warned you to flee? He said, but if you want to come, then produce, have repentance that, that uh, with the fruit of repentance should, should match up. Bring forth fruit that is meat for repentance. Bring forth fruit that fits repentance. Now you said you repented, but then if you went on looking at pornography unashamedly, without confession, you need to examine yourself. Are you saved? If you refuse to let go of bitterness and unforgiveness, you need to search the Lord. You need to search your heart. Because Jesus says to forgive. Go back and find out. If you just cuss like a sailor and you walk around and you badmouth people and you backbite and you gossip and you tear people down, you need to search your heart. Are you saved? If you're going about and you're enjoying and delighting in filth and and all kinds of wickedness and you delight in murder and bloodshed and violence... Even if you don't do it personally, if you're enjoying it through the games you're watching, your, your, the movies you're watching, the music you're listening to, search your heart. Search your heart. Be, be careful. Because there's a lot of people faking it, and they're going to fake it very well right up until the time they're brought before the judgment seat of Christ. But Jesus made it very clear. Who are my mother, my brethren, my sisters. It's the people that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, do we still sin? Of course we do. We are still sinners. We still fall short. But when you're walking in the light, you know what you tripped over. The man who walks in darkness, he trips. He don't know what he tripped over. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know why. He's got this emptiness in his heart. He doesn't know why he's got a guilty conscience. He doesn't know why he has emotional problems. He doesn't know why he's struggling with all these things. But it's in direct relation to his sin, but he doesn't know it. But if you've had the light turned on and there's a sin in your life, there should be real discomfort. You ever had a case of the Holy Ghost miseries? You ever had that? If you've never had it and you've been saved for any length of time, you need to really search and see if you're Christian. If you've never had the Holy Ghost miseries, You really need to find out if you're saved. And what I mean is when your conscience bothers you and you're troubled and you can't stand it. You notice when David David sinned. He sinned by lusting at Bathsheba, committing adultery with Bathsheba, conspiring to kill Bathsheba's husband, sending a lot of other men to their death in order to cover up his sin. I mean, he had sinned big. And a whole year went by. He's playing his harp. He's going down to the temple. He's shaking the preacher's hand. But there's evidence that he knew something was wrong. Because when he repents, in Psalm 51, we have this beautiful prayer of repentance. He says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. I tell you, David knew 
knew that he was alienated from God. He knew something was wrong. He was discontent. He probably was losing sleep. He was probably struggling in his life because the Holy Spirit, what does he do? What's his job? What did Jesus say the Holy Spirit does? He says he, when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. If you've had the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, you're not comfortable in your sin. It makes you uncomfortable. Nothing will make you more unhappy. If people think, oh, well, when you get saved, everything goes good and everything's happy. I want to tell you something. God will make you miserable doing things that you did before and you enjoyed. Because that's the nature of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit doesn't like to live in a dirty house. He comes into a man's life and he starts to clean up. He starts to reprove. He starts to make us miserable. The only way to be happy in Jesus is what? To trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That is the truth. Obedience. Faith produces works. It's not that faith saves. Faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. It's never alone. It's always accompanied by something. And Jesus wants us to know, the people that are the royal family are not my physical brothers, my physical sister, my physical mother. The royal family, whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And so James doesn't come and boast his title that he is the brother of the Lord. Other people refer to him. Paul refers to him as the brother of the Lord. But James and Jude both say, Jude refers to himself as the brother of James, the pastor of Jerusalem. And James, even if he was a cousin, even if he was a cousin, you know, how many of us, if we were the cousin of the Lord in flesh, would say, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I've... Anybody proud of their genealogy? You ever look into your genealogy? I'm sure some people are. You, you look back. I'm, I'm really proud of a guy. I don't know. I know very little about him. I know he was shot in the ankle in the Revolutionary War named Thomas Royal. And I, when I learned that I had a, an ancestor that fought in the war, came from England and fought against his own countrymen in the war for independence, you know, I take a little pride in that. I've I, I got to tell you, I, that's fascinating to me. I love learning that kind of thing. But James was either the biological brother or at the very least, a cousin of Jesus. He does not mention it. What does he say? He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people see a conflict between Paul, who says you're saved without works, you're justified by faith without the works of the law, and and James, who at one point actually says you're justified by works, but meaning works is the proof of the living faith is really what he's getting at not that you can work enough to earn your salvation but the point james is going to make later in the book and we're going to look at it more in detail is that a living faith in god is going to produce works and so we see person having godly works and we see the evidence of the work of god working in his heart especially when those works cost him something but but james makes a testimony of faith here James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he testifies a couple things. Now I want to quote to you a very familiar verse. A lot of you have it memorized, I'm sure, is in Romans 10, 9 and 10. And this is the kind of verse that we give people, 9, 9, 10, and 11. This is the kind of verse that we tell people when they say, what do I got to do to be saved? We may very well quote Romans 10, 9, 10, and 11. Here's what it says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So Paul says, when you, for, for a person to be saved, whosoever, well, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Very emphatic. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Now here's our problem. This was readily understood by the Romans that he was writing to. Because to say Jesus Christ is curious was to identify him as the all-encompassing authority in their lives. Who do you call Curios? You call Caesar Curios. To confess that Jesus is Curios, He is Lord, that's the Greek word for Lord, meant that you're saying, I repent. I submit. I surrender. You're the boss. You're the one to whom I 
I give my allegiance, my obedience, and my service. Unfortunately, that's, that's fallen on deaf ears in America because many, many people, they'll say, yeah, he's my Lord, he's my Savior, but there's no, there's no effort to obey him in any way. Now, does James make this confession of faith that Jesus is Lord and that he's risen from the dead? He essentially has made that here by implication. He doesn't say, James, a servant of God uh, and a believer and a teacher who died, you know, 30-something years ago. Jesus, he's the servant of Jesus now. What does that mean? He's confessing faith in the resurrection. He's not just a believer in God and a follower of the teacher Jesus, but he's saying, I am an actual servant of the living Jesus right now. It's present tense. I am serving a living Jesus. If you're to be saved, you have to believe in the resurrection. This is essential to the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that the gospel, according to this gospel, Paul says, Christ rose from the dead. He paid for our sins. He rose from the dead. That's essential to being a Christian. To be a Christian, we must confess that Jesus has risen from the dead after making an atonement for our sins and that He is our Lord. He is our Savior. But so many call Him Lord and it doesn't ever have fruit in their lives. It doesn't ever have fruit. It never produces anything. But to those who have acknowledged the Lordship, you know, by the way, another thing, we don't make Jesus Lord of our life. We don't make Him Lord of our life. I used to use that phrase a lot and somebody corrected me on it and they were right. I didn't make Jesus Lord of my life. You can't make Jesus Lord of your life. You can acknowledge Him as Lord of your life. But guess what? Jesus is your Lord, whether you like it or not. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single one. The arrogance of Ahmadinejad will come to an end. The arrogance of those who say, well, he was a good teacher, will come to an end. He is Lord, whether we like it or not. The question is, are we going to bow in worship, or are we going to bow under his foot in subjugation and be crushed and cast into the lake of fire? That is the real question. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has demonstrated his right to be the heir of all things and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The good news is if you do it now and you submit yourself to him, he says you shall be saved. He has extended mercy to all who call upon his name in faith, believing that God has raised him from the dead and that he is Lord. There's another passage. One more I want to go to. It's in Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6. Now, James uh, many times quotes or refers to or alludes to, there's many times in the book of James, it's very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there's the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Plain was in Luke 6. And they're very similar. And what it is is basic teaching This is how you live. You're a disciple of Christ. This is what your Lord, this is what your Master is expecting of you. Now, I'm not going to do an expository sermon on the Sermon on the Mount or of Luke 6 this morning, but I want to give you the conclusion of the Sermon on the Plain here in Luke 6.43. We're getting close to the conclusion. Luke 6.43, Jesus said, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth the corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Now what's he saying here? He's saying, you know what? We know a tree by what it produces. When you want to identify a tree, even if it's not a fruit tree, you go out, you look at the shape of the leaves, you look at the the, the way the bark looks, and you can identify what that tree is by the characteristics that it produces. And that's basically what James is saying. You know a tree by its fruit. In fact, he says that. He says that a grape can't bury olive berries, neither in uh, olive berries figs. And he makes it very clear that we produce, if we have a living faith in the living God, it's going to produce living works out of our life. It's going to produce something. And Jesus said, basically, examine yourself. What fruit are you producing? A good tree does not bring forth corrupt fruit. Verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart 
bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So now what's he saying? He's saying, you know what? Whatever is on the inside is what's coming out. What you say, what you speak, how you live is evidence of where your faith is and what you truly believe. If you truly believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you acknowledge He has a right to tell you what to do. If you truly believe that Jesus paid for your sins on the cross as a substitute, then you recognize that He has a right to require this of you. And not only so, it should be your delight. Hallowed God, you loved me a sinner. Here I was, a lion, thieving, adulterer at heart, and you went to the cross because you loved me. Shouldn't that make you have a heart of gratitude? That, that your eternity was on the line and God loved you enough to leave heaven where He never had pain, where He never had suffering, where all the angels cried day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He left all of that to take on human form and the diapers that went with it. He left, in the Psalms it says, the clouds are the dust of His feet. But He came down and He lived with us and the dust of His feet were the dust of the road. Christ came down to our level because He loved you. He redeemed you. And that's why when we finally get to Romans 12 in our study of Romans, it says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice. What he's saying is, look at the mercy God has shown you. Look at the forgiveness He's extended to you. I beseech you, seeing as how God has forgiven you so much that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. Verse 46, now here's the words that sting. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? You see, even then, he had all kinds of people out in the audience. They wanted to be close to Jesus because he's the miracle man. He's the guy that takes a couple loaves of bread and he starts splitting it up and he feeds thousands. He's the man that opens the blind eyes. He causes the the deaf to hear, the blind eyes to see, the lame to walk, the dead to rise again. Who doesn't want to be near Jesus? And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Oh, there's multitudes of churches that have Jesus Christ mentioned in the name, that have it above the door, that have flags on the wall, and they sing about Jesus, but they don't want to do what He says. And the evidence is in the fact that the church of America is filled with adultery and fornication and divorce and pornography and blasphemy and cursing and filthy movies and filthy games. And we say, and he says, why do you call me Lord and do not the simple things I say? You know, sometimes with children, children get selective hearing. Yeah, somehow it's like, well, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. Well, I bet if I was calling you for ice cream, you would have heard me. And we as Christians can get selective hearing. And we, we, we don't, well, I didn't hear, I didn't know. You know, if you choose not to read the Word of God so that you don't know what to be accountable to, that's selective hearing. If you choose not to study the Scriptures, not to listen to sermons, with the abundance of the available material that you can listen to sermons, I want to tell you, you can, get, you can download an app where you can hear the Word of God on your cell phone. I mean, you know, it's all about priorities. You say, well, I can't afford it. Well, fast for three days a month, save up the money from the food, and get yourself some Word of God. I bet you can afford it. If it's a priority. But we have selective hearing. We have selective hearing. We should, we should want to know God's word. We should want to know his will. Isn't it reasonable that we should want to know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Isn't that reasonable seeing as how he took our place on the cross? Shouldn't we want to serve him? Shouldn't we want to live out our lives? I mean, after all, this life is so brief. If we believe what he said, this life, as James says, is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. This life is going to be gone in no time. 
Now, suppose you have the opportunity to live all of your days in luxury, which we do in America largely. I mean, kings would have loved to have, a few hundred years ago, would have loved to have the flush toilets that we have and to have the air conditioning that we have and to have the, the ability to transportation that we have and the exotic foods that in the middle of the winter you can eat your pineapple and your blueberries, as I like to say. We live in great luxury. But what are we doing for Christ? What are we doing for Jesus? That's an open-ended question, not meant to condemn, because I know many of you, I just, I appreciate, I appreciate things that I see that goes on here. I really do. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. Let's just search ourselves, though, and say, Lord, I got a limited time of earth. Our, our, our yearning should be, God, I want to do something for you. I, I want to lead some people to Christ. I want to see, I want to see the, the widows and the orphans as it talks about in James 1 later on in the chapter. I, I want to see them closed and fed and housed. And, 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 and we, we've got to make a break with the culture that says it's all about a fancier car. It's all about a bigger house. It's all about, it's all about fancier clothing and looking the, keeping up with the Joneses. But it's not about keeping up with the Joneses. Let's just try to keep up with the Jameses. So he goes on, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundations on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. He says, listen, if you're hearing these things, if you're hearing these sermons, if you're hearing these teachings, if you've got that, you've got the Bible in five different translations sitting on your shelf, and you've got access, accessibility to it on the internet, accessibility to it on the radio, and you hear it, but you don't do it, you're like this guy who went out and he built a castle on the sand. Now, now what's going to happen if you build a castle on the sand? It's going, to, it's going to topple when the first hurricane comes on. I tell you, these hurricanes come. I don't, I don't understand people. People in Louisiana need to read this. I mean, they don't just build on the sand. They build below sea level. I mean, come on. And so what happens when the rain descends and the floods came and beat upon the house? It was flooded. And everybody's like, well, I don't understand. How could this happen to me? Well, <laughs> you built below sea level. And the dike wasn't in good shape when you moved there. But what's far more foolish is for us to have accessibility to the Word of God to the level that we do, and we don't live what He preaches. Following Christ is going to cost you something. And so James is content to call himself the slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this book, as we get into it in the coming weeks, it's about practical living. And so I want to say it real clearly today. If you're not saved, I don't want to ever lead anybody to believe that you can do enough good works to earn the favor of God. This book, James, James was a pastor. He was the pastor of Jerusalem. And James watched a lot of his congregation leave because of persecution, not because they didn't like the message he was preaching. He was preaching the word. He was teaching the saints. And when the first persecution starts, the 12 tribes are scattered abroad. They're scattered abroad. And so James is writing to the fellow believers, his brethren, most of which are Jewish Christians, but I, I don't think the 12 tribes refers to merely the 12 tribes. I think it refers to the church. And talk about that and prove that another Sunday. But, but he's writing to them because he wants them to know, as you go, let your faith produce works. This is a book written for Christians. And I can always bring it down every time we read the law of God, every time we read practical illustration, one implication, maybe not, maybe not today, maybe the light won't turn on for some false converts, but there might be false converts in here. Maybe it'll be the next sermon or the next sermon, and you go, oh wow, ah oh, Lord God, I'm a man of unclean lips. I need your cleansing power. And that's one of the things the law does, is it breaks us. It shows us how ugly we really are. James says in chapter 1, it's like a mirror. We look into it, and we see, we see the reality of who we are. We look at the law of God and we see ourselves as sinners. And it strips away our self-righteousness. And we realize, I don't want to go before God in my righteousness. I want to trust in the righteousness of Christ. So even as we're going to come to the communion table this morning, that's what we do. We come to the communion table. And the Bible says, let a man examine himself. 
Let him examine himself. I've seen people through the years, I've seen various people that take communion and I, I know by the fruit they're not walking in truth. And they take it without any fear whatsoever. I want to tell you, if that's you, brother and sister, that's a tremendously scary thing. And so some people say, well, I simply won't take it then. I won't take it because I don't want to take communion unclean. You know what? You're still remembering Christ and you're remembering, remembering Him consciously deciding not to obey Him. That's not safe. So as we come in contact with these practical teachings of James, it's going to expose areas of our lives and our hearts. I know it's going to expose areas of me too because it's what the Word does. It, it cuts both ways. And as it does, and we come to the communion table, we remember Christ has redeemed us. And we confess our sins and we forsake them. Because Jesus ultimately, what does he say? He said, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So the fact that we sin is not proof that we're not one of the Lord's brethren. The fact that we go on comfortably in it without any disturbance in our soul, that, that should make us examine ourselves. That should make us examine ourselves. And so this morning as we prepare for communion, prepare your hearts. Go before the Lord. Say, Lord, search my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And do so in, in, in the knowledge that he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray this morning. Lord, you've said that if we believe in our heart that God hath raised up your Son from the dead and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we will be saved. Father, there may be someone in here this morning that's come to the realization they've been faking it and they need you. They need your forgiveness. They need your salvation. I pray, God, this morning that you would touch them in their heart that you'd fill their heart with faith and with the peace of God and you'd draw them to yourself. You'd wash them clean. You'd justify them, sanctify them, and make them vessels fit for the Master's use. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.